the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast is just two guys and maybe a guest or two discussing Bitcoin, Bitcoin equities, and the related macroeconomic space. It's not meant to be financial advice. So please, if you're doing any investing after listening to our program, do your own research, do your own due diligence, and understand that any money you invest can be lost. The show is meant for entertainment purposes only, and we hope you enjoy the program. Friends and enemies, welcome to another episode of the Canadian Bitcoiners Podcast 2024 All-Time High Fuck You, Fuck Off Edition. My name is Joey, and the other panel is Len. We'll see how calm you are when we hit the all-time high. You look calm now. What's going on? How are you? No, I'm I'm good, man. I don't keep even if it hits that number, which we perceive to be the all-time high, it's just it's a number. Um everything's good here. It's a lot of big dick energy going on, and deservedly so. <laughs> It's been great, man. Yeah. Warm day outside, sun was shining, price of Bitcoin is going up. But I bought some sats yesterday. Man, it's not it's it's not a, a very cheap anymore. I didn't get a lot for what I purchased. You know, like I put down some money and used to get so much more. So yeah. for better or for worse, it is like that. How are you, Joey? I'm great, man. I've never been better. I wore my Bitcoin shirt, my bull Bitcoin shirt to work today. Uh, and I did last week too, actually. Somebody at work today said to me in the uh, hallway that Bitcoin is still a Ponzi scheme. So can't, can't, can't win them all, can't help everybody, right? But uh, it does feel good to be sitting here. Like I'd be lying if I said it didn't feel good to be sitting here. I think, Len, this is our third year anniversary as well. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, or, later this month is going to be the yeah, third year. Or we're really that. close. We're really close. Mm-hmm. Um we did this show through basically two full years of doo-doo price as far as TradFi was concerned. We were here through a couple of different big drop-offs, Terra Luna, FTX, among others, other huge price knocks that uh, had the typical you know, onlookers, no-coiners, dancing on our graves, the shifts, the others, and... Uh, Again, I'd be lying if I said that it didn't feel good. I didn't convince as many people as I wanted to, especially because when we first started doing the show, I feel like I was talking a lot more about Bitcoin to people who didn't have any and trying to convince them to buy some. And uh, I'm kind of past that phase of my stage of my like uh, evangelism now. That that phase of just tr- trying to convince everybody I meet. I'm more the you know if you don't like it, don't buy it type now. But I've heard some great stories. I won't name names, but I've heard two today. Great stories from people who. Our friends of mine who listen to the show, uh, who are in a position now to do things they just wouldn't be in a position to do otherwise because of Bitcoin. And I don't think that's 100% me and you, but I do think it's at least part me and you, part the community we have here at CBP and part the shit posting on Twitter. And I hate to admit it, Len, but probably part the laser eyes too. And uh, I really feel good. Giving credit to laser eyes. I really feel feel good about it, man. I think we've done a lot of good. I think Bitcoin has done a lot of good for a lot of people. And it's not just number go up. It's quality of life go up. It's thinking ahead, go up, and it's be a better man or woman, go up too. And uh, this whole price action thing is just a cherry on top. You know what I mean? So let's fucking go, like the chat says. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's it's a good day. Even when we, if we do get to that magical number, 69,000, whatever the fuck it may be, it's really not the all time high. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a fiat number, right? Like it, that's like somebody coming here saying that they make $100,000 a year and getting a 3% raise in their salary. And they're saying, yeah, I'm making more this year than last year. You're not, man. You're <laughs> making less this year than you were last year. And the reality is 69 is not the all-time high. It's probably somewhere closer to $90,000 if you take into consideration the real inflation rate, whatever yeah. that may be. So until we get to that that number, whatever it is, and I'm going to say it's close to 90000 then we're not even close to the all-time high. This is just a fiat celebration. G- Gandalf had the uh, tweet, I think like two days ago, three days ago, of uh, someone's calculation of what the all-time high was. I think it was like 79 or something like that. That's, that's taking into consideration the, CPI. That's the number, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And we sure. know it was double digits. Now you do double mm-hmm. digits for a couple of years, plus throw in four months. Uh, then you, because the last all-time high was November of 2022. Um, was it 2022? Whatever the fuck it was. 21, sorry, November 2021. So that's, you know, 27 months ago, 28 months ago. Do the math. Get a few it, guesses it in the chat, right? Yeah, Boom Dust, Boomer, our, our buddy saying 79, Noda, another uh, friend of the show, 87. 87 seems more legitimate. Yeah, so I mean, plus. 
You know so what, Len? That's, that's the number we should be doing. And since you're getting there, we're close to 100. Let's let's actually make a round number of $100,000. That'll be the <laughs> celebration. So screw this 89 or 87 or 90. $100,000, that's the fucking celebration. Until then, it's I, just all fiat. I do think we just had the highest daily close ever, though. Um, we closed the candle closes at seven. We closed at about 68,300, something like that, 350. That's the highest ever, which is unbelievable. Um, anyway, look, we got a lot to talk about tonight. Let's um, do the sponsor, Sponsors. shall we? Yeah, yeah, Easy DNS. Uh, been with the program now for more than a year. Mark and the team over there have been incredible. He just sent us uh, his book on DNS. I think on the weekend I got it. Friday or Saturday I got mine. Uh, so I'm looking forward to reading that and learning a bit more about the art of DNS hosting and DNS security. In the meantime, if you want to uh, host something, start a website doing, uh, I don't know, whatever. Whatever your, it is. For us, it was CVP. Uh, for some of you guys, maybe you want to, um, I don't know, sell pictures of your feet or build an app or whatever, and you want to market it and build a website around it. Mark will help you do that. And uh, on top of that, his team helped us put together a number of different features on our uh, our website, including email, which we're not using yet, but we could, PGP and GPG. If you want to use a virtual private server, Mark can help you with that. They got stuff over there for your NASA Relay, your Bitcoin node, your nodeless implementation, and your BTC pay server if you want. I think a lot of you will probably want to start taking Bitcoin for your services and your products if you haven't already. That would be my recommendation. And you can do all that stuff on the cheap. Uh, use our code CPP Media. Get fifty percent off your first round of buys through Easy DNS. I know a bunch of you have done it already. I have heard a few. From, uh, I've heard from a few of you that you're planning on doing it soon. And uh, there's no better time to build than a bear market. But the second best time, Len, is in a bull market. And uh, if you haven't done it yet, now's the time to start. Easy DNS. Tell them we sent you. Yeah, Mark's in the chat tonight. Mark, what's going on? A uh, great friend of the show, great partner, and we're looking forward to seeing what you guys do on his platform. Who else we got as a sponsor? Uh, bull Bitcoin. You know, bull Bitcoin, what can you say about them? They don't go down like Coinbase does. They stay up, always up, because you could buy and sell your Bitcoin if you wanted to. Like Joey said, it, some people may want to consider selling your Bitcoin right now. Me, I prefer to hold on to it. But everybody's different. Some people have bills to pay. Do whichever you want. This is Bitcoin. You have that freedom alongside it. So you could buy your Bitcoin on-chain. You could buy your Bitcoin through Lightning when fees are going up, and they are right now. Through all this hoopla with the price, we are missing the fact that the price of the transactions, they are slowly creeping up. So mm -hmm. well, Bitcoin has you covered. You could buy with Lightning. But not just that. You could then, if you want to spend your Bitcoin, you could do so and pay your bills with Bitcoin. So again, with the price of Bitcoin going up, it makes it more advantageous to start spending your Bitcoin, start paying your bills like your electricity bill, your mortgage, whatever the fuck you want to spend it on. You can do it with full Bitcoin. You can also buy gift cards. And with that, you're essentially spending your Bitcoin in the real world. And it's a good way to show that there's a circular economy here that you could spend your Bitcoin in the way that, well, th through gift cards, at least it works in that regard. And the last thing they have, which is the best, in my opinion, is the KYC free. Oh, you yeah. go to Canada Post, load up your money, it blows up your KYC free bull Bitcoin account, and you could buy that KYC free Bitcoin from bull Bitcoin. Cheapest in the game, the spread is the cheapest in Canada. Can't say about the rest of the world, there might be somewhere else that's cheaper. But at least over here in Canada, it's the cheapest you can get with KYC free. We talk about it, why you should get KYC free. We talk about it all the time. Certainly consider it. If you haven't yet started your stack, do so yesterday. If not, start it today. Yeah, man, it's uh, never been more important. And it's going to be more important than ever going forward. Let me tell you that. Uh, I'm saying we're going to stay in the, in the air until we get an all-time high. At, yeah, Mark. <laughs> Mark is the sponsor, so <laughs> we have to do that. I don't know. I have to find uh, out. I got to check our non-existent contract with Easy DNS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a uh, couple things for housekeeping. Last week, Len, uh, who was your guest on uh, Wednesday night? Oh, we had Dan and Mike from the High Hash Rate Podcast that came on. It was a home and home series, mm -hmm. and this time we were the home team, and it was a great episode and we had a lot of feedback on that which was really nice thank you everybody that listened in and provided feedback on that and this week we have the people coming in from DTAC and they are a company that's based out of Montreal and they provide uh, Bitcoin mining solutions for people out there so if you want to buy like an ASIC or any components to hook up an ASIC stuff like that they have you covered it's the Canadian version I would say of uh, Kaboom Racks yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's based on Montreal. Love to talk with them and, and hopefully we could get them some exposure. And if anybody wants to do some home mining or even expand on their large mining operation, they could probably help you out. I think next week, uh, not to spoil it or get ahead of myself, but I believe we're going to also have Tour de Meester come on. The king of the bull sauce uh, coming out to discuss his report 
that came out a little while ago now talking about preparing for the next Bitcoin bull run. And uh, safe to say, I think it's here. He just did Marty's show. I listened to it this morning. I had to message him and a little bit of a, uh, an assist from Mark as well. So he's going to come on next week, I think. I'm going to set up a date next weekend or this weekend coming up. So maybe next week you get two interviews with uh, two very high quality guests. Um, Len, do you want to talk about the conference quick? We're supposed to... Uh, yeah, so yeah. the Canadian Bitcoin conference is taking place this year in Montreal, May, I forget the actual dates. It's but like it's 13th or 14th or something. You guys in the chat will know anyway. So they have a buy one, get one free going on right now. So if you are sitting on the fence about buying a ticket, well, it might be a good time to execute on your order because when you buy one, you get a second one for free. This offer is not going to be there for too long, so certainly execute that very soon if you choose to do so. And also until March 15th, you could also earn 5% sats back on your ticket sales. So it's another way to get some, at least something back from buying. So you get 5% sats back on your ticket sales. So yeah. buy one, get one free and some sats back at the same time. The sats back are only available until March 15th. That's great. So I would suggest if you're looking to go there, definitely do it. There yeah, it is. Somebody mentioned May 16th yeah. to 18th, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Looking forward to it, man. I'm going to be there. Len is, I think, not going to be there. I don't want to. No, May is a tough time for me. I have so many birthdays mm. in that month. It's uh, it's a tough time for me to get out of the city. Out of the basement. Out of the basement. Sorry, out of the basement. Yeah, exactly that. I, <laughs> I screwed up. Yeah. I, I, should I, I? I can't give up this, you know, the charade here. I sometimes get out of the basement, people. I sometimes <laughs> do. But uh, unfortunately, yeah, me, I'm stuck. I'm stuck here. The Metro in the chat asking, how do we get in on the offer? To be honest with you, I have no idea. That's a good question. We didn't really ask that uh, of the conference organizers, Dan and Manuela, but I'm sure they'll do it. Message Plate Liquor on uh, Twitter if you haven't, if you have them on Twitter, Plate Liquor 21 or whatever his handle is, and ask him, he'll know. Or just message the conference uh, on Twitter. They're on there as well. I think they're in a couple of the Canadian Telegram channels ah, too. So lots my bad. Of it's not buy one, get one free. It's buy one, get one 50%. My mistake. Okay, buy one, get one 50% off. There you go. Okay. Land will pay the other half of uh, your 50% off ticket. I'll pay it in Doge. <laughs> there's that chat we're in. I can't believe there's so much. Dog I love that. Everyone, everyone is dealing in shit coins now. True bull market Why? behavior. True bull market behavior. The sad thing is all we hear about are the gains. We never hear about the losses. I Those know. losses, they're buried and never yeah. to be discovered. But gains, oh, it's here, there, and everywhere. It's like your buddy who always wins at the casino every time he goes, right? But uh, anyway. Yeah, how so, many losses do he have? The fuck, okay, he's, he's got them repossessing his car. He's, yeah, he's, they, got the, they got the lock on his uh <laughs> His yeah, like, nobody <laughs> fucking always wins. That's right. Okay, Beetle, so where do you want to do you want to do boost? Should we do boost? Yeah, I do. I, I okay. got a few of them. It's a top five in terms of donations. So thank you very much for people who have donated to us. We're going to be donating this to a worthy cause very, very soon. Doug, we, can talk, we can talk about the cause if you want. I think we agreed on the cause, right? I, I think we're, you know, it sounds like a good one. If there's a better yeah. one, I'll be happy to, but no, I'm, let's, I'm indifferent. Let's do, we're going to give it to open sats. So we're going to collect for a few weeks. Then we're going to give the sats to open sats. They seem to be doing a lot of good work. Never more important than now to support open source development. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Sitting on right now, 133,000 sats and climbing. So <laughs> Doug and Roop, 525 sats. This is with respect to the high hash rate episode I just did. He says, love the closing message message to all the fathers out there. Appreciated it. For the husbands, hang in there. Not long you'll get a, whoa, you knew this all along. And this was a, with reference to the end of the show. That was one of the messages, the final words by Dan on that show. Mo BTC Dick, 550 sats. He writes in, curious if you, Len, would rather have the ETF or the ordinal and why? Because Ooh. one of the questions I asked him, I said, which would you rather hold for 10 years, the ETF, or one year an ordinal and see if you could sell whichever one for you know, whatever you can. I grudgingly, I'll take the ETF. Mm. Principle. Is yeah. is th I would take the, I'd probably take the ordinal, honestly. Okay. <laughs> thank you very ETF. much, ladies and gentlemen. This has been a fantastic <laughs> episode. And I'm going to just take off. Isn't the ordinal more, <laughs> he leaves. Isn't the ordinal more in custody than the ETF? I don't know. Like, I'm trying to see, I'm trying it's to. It's a do sat, man. You're you. fucking buying a sat, a single <laughs> sat. Right? So I, you, I mean, they're both <laughs> shit. I'm not going to you know, own either it one. Is. But if you're paying two sats for that one, you got a rip. At least the other one, there's a, a slight <laughs> chance, at least a slight chance that you're going to fucking get a. Oh, anyways, Jordan. Yeah. 1,000 sats says, thanks, Len, for the, the lightning fast response about UTXOs. Thanks you very much, Jordab, for the donation. He's, he's asking a UTXO question. And then, like I mentioned to him, and I'll just mention it here, the general consensus is you want to have at least 1 million sat 
consolidation, sometimes even more. So it may be advantageous to have even some a mix of a bunch of them, but one million is generally the the minimum you should be seeking. And but really, this is just all theory at this point. So who knows? Yeah, it's an academic exercise. Do you want? I don't want to give up your jam here, but do you want to tell people what you did Saturday night? I think it was Saturday night you did it, looking at the show emails. Oh no, Sunday morning. Uh, so, Sunday, Sunday, do you want? Can we share? Can we share that? Like, I want to give you a round of applause, pat on the back for that. I got is another it, one coming up this weekend. It, so, so Len, Len, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say because you're gonna be too modest. We get emails at the show address all the time, the Gmail address, CanadianBitcoiners at gmail.com, I think it is, or Canadian Bitcoiners podcast. And we get a lot of emails where like people are just asking like technical questions, stuff about, you know, UTXO management or cold storage or how do I do this? How do I do that? This fucking guy in the other panel is on the phone with people he's never met, doesn't know from Adam or Eve, giving technical help to them at God knows what time on Sunday morning, the Lord's Day. And answering emails to them, receiving emails from them Sunday night, Friday night, talking to them about what's going on. And he, this is not the only time I've seen this in the show in the show account. I don't often talk about it because I don't want to blow up Len's spot. But this is incredible from you, man. Like I got to say, like I, it made me happy to see that. And there's not enough people in Bitcoin doing this kind of stuff for free. Um, it's important to all of us that we learn this stuff. And so to have you doing that really is incredible. I just want to commend you for that on the air here. That's really yeah. incredible stuff. So that gentleman, uh, I don't want to say who it is, very, very common name. You could kind of guess what his first name would be, but uh, he listens to the show. He, he had some questions, and I was happy to answer. So, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully he'll continue to li continue listen to the show. If not, oh, well, we lost a customer in the process. <laughs> I think he's going to listen to our show. Um, business Cat 4444 Sats writes in, just simply powerful, powerful. And that's with regards to our other notable news stories or notable news stories. How notable were they last week? I thought they were it, pretty notable. Powerful actually. enough. Yeah. And uh, maybe it should be last... other powerful stories instead of other notable stories. <laughs> like, what we could change is this is it's a you know a, an ever evolving title. <laughs> Nothing is set in stone. <laughs> and fundamentals uh, writes in 9,400 sats. He says number one had to pull over to boost the show. It's a nexus of signal and I'm honored to have a rock paper Bitcoin be the pot of choice for Dan and Mike. Two Mike, it's okay. I choose the ETF over a JPEG if it could be Fidelity and not Coinbase. Three, Dan's explanation of a world where AI are transacting on chain and humans are competing is going to get clipped and shared. That's A plus plus content. Yeah, so there you go. Thank you very much. There's quite a bit of sats you sent over. Nine four four, I'm sorry, nine thousand four hundred sats. It's not going to go by me that I didn't understand as uh, paying homage to NHL. And 94. Thank you very much. So. Right on. Love that. Love that. Okay, let's um let's get into it, shall we? That was a long intro. 17 minutes in. We got yeah. any stories we want to talk about, or should we just keep talking about like uh you know peripheral stuff? It's up to you. I guess. <laughs> let's talk about stuff that's actually <laughs> pertinent to people. So this past week, and I'm gonna be brief on this one, is because we had a, an epic rally. Now, don't focus what happened today, focus what happened last week. And we one of the defining moments which happened last week is we had the price of Bitcoin creep up to around $64,000. And then what happened shortly thereafter, Coinbase mysteriously went offline, oh, causing the price to drop $4,000 in a matter of minutes. And it, I did a tweet about this. It really reminds me of the Wojak video of the guy that's saying this. <laughs> dump it. <laughs> that's what it really is. The guy's in the phone, <laughs> dump it, Coinbase. <laughs> dump it. They did. <laughs> they didn't just do it. They did it again today. Those fucking bricks. I love but, it. Something of note is they were saying that they were experiencing high volume and hence it must have triggered something over there that they went offline. Just from last week. I don't know what happened today, by the way. Maybe the same thing, but just the some volume latency from last issues today, I think. Not really it went offline, but some latency issues today is what I read. Okay. So yeah, and some more zero balance displays, which is I think a key thing for these outages. But anyway, you'll get into that, I'm sure. They they gotta get easy DNS on, on the horn and, and hook up with them. Maybe they <laughs> the mark <laughs> the mark right? signal put it in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they need better service. But anyways, if you look at the, the volume, and I remember this specifically, this event in April 2001, the volume in Bitcoin, if the volume of Bitcoin being traded that time was immense. I remember seeing the buy and sell, the, just the spread between the orders of buy and sell was over a thousand dollars. The price of Bitcoin was going up and down very fast, and a lot of exchanges at that time, April 2000, uh, 2021, couldn't withstand the volume. The volume this time around, at least from last week, was less than that. So yeah. you look at it's something seems a little strange here. And plus you figure Coinbase has a couple of years, two and a half years since then, almost three years. 
to improve their efficiency and roll up better uh, so- hardware and software and so forth. But <laughs> Dan from a high hash rate actually pr- proposed something very interesting, and he was speculating. This is all speculation from him, so don't. You don't nail him to the cross if, he, if he's wrong. He says that Coinbase does have the capacity to deal with high volume. He just predict, uh, sorry, he just hypothesized that it's the sudden surge in volume that causes issues. He says that they most likely have the ability to deal with it, but all this is just not always online. They ramp up as demand increases. But if there's a sudden surge, that those computers, the, the hardware, doesn't have an opportunity to, to scale up and uh, to help them with the sudden surge in volume. So that that may be true. I don't know, but it just seems odd that Coinbase, the largest exchange, I think it's past Binance, if not it's one and two, they're suffering as a result of this. I don't know. And another thing that's interesting, at least from last week, when the price dropped four thousand dollars in a matter of minutes, why? Why did it drop? Mm-hmm. Like, s- sure, a exchange went offline. Does that mean Bitcoin is any less <laughs> the, the fundamentals change? Hell no. It's a fucking. It's a fiat company that isn't able to withstand like i don't know i see that kind of shit that's fucking nuts but anyways we still had an epic rally we're now approaching what is it now like 68.3 right now 68.4 we're getting yeah. close to the fiat so all time high so the close. and it's just it's been a fun ride people out there hopefully you're out there enjoying it and you're you know it's a lot of big dick energy and it's fucking it's deserved it because like you mentioned the beginning of the show we we've been taking a beating for the past two years and change now is the time we could hold our heads high and there's a lot of those shit coins that are not in a dog field that are not keeping up with Bitcoin. Look at ETH. Look at mm-hmm. uh, Solana. Fucking, they're, they're all fucking. They're, they're they're all lagging behind. Bitcoin. All the money is coming into it. All the attention is coming to it. It's just too bad that it's the ETFs. I'm pretty sure it is driving a lot of this. I've talked negatively about. Okay. Well, yeah. Why? Why do you say? Because that was my first question for you. First of all, I want to um, break some news here. Friend of the show, Wayfaring, is writing a piece, a technical piece, I believe, on the Coinbase crashes. And uh, we're going to run it on the CBP website when it's ready. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. He's a very bright guy. And I, anytime he shares his opinion, I'm, I'm a person who's definitely looking to listen and find out what he thinks about um, you know X, Y, or Z. So we're going to run that on the website in the next few days. That's number one. Number two, I was going to ask you if you're ready to admit the ETFs were a good thing for Bitcoin or not. It doesn't sound like you are. Why not? It's a short-term... Look, the price went up as a result of it. It is doing one thing. It's taking a lot of potential on-chain transactions off to something else. I'd prefer to see to go to something else that is more adjacent to Bitcoin. I don't know what it can, what I, it can be. I'm, I'm talking very cryptic right now because potentially it may not even exist. Well, mm. likely it doesn't exist. But that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see some organic people coming in and organically using Bitcoin and buying Bitcoin and that will help drive these L2s to be ready for prime time. I don't, the ETFs, you're essentially giving all this power to them. They're holding on to your Bitcoin and you're asking them to give it back to you at the end. They'll likely give it back to you in the end. But there's a shred of like doubt in my mind, the smallest of doubt that grows by the day that maybe it will not be. What, like, hypothetically, what if things go really shitty with the economy and they mm-hmm. see you can't take your money to the market? This is potentially could happen. And this this would also be your fucking your money that's with Bitcoin with the ETF that is stuck there. So I I don't want to give up my keys. And when you buy through an ETF, you are essentially you don't even have the keys. You're you're fucking playing with fiat money and having them uh, tie it to the price of Bitcoin. They have the keys. You're saying here buy it with this money and you you own the keys. They take all of the gain. You take some of the risk. You, you probably come out okay in the end. But I don't want to deal with probably. I want to deal with guarantees. I, I agree. Some like I, don't get me wrong. I understand what you're saying, and I agree that the ETF is a suboptimal product for people who want to hold Bitcoin and are you know keen on the Bitcoin ethos for sure. No doubt about that. But then I also think about the stuff that I've seen sort of in the last three weeks, four weeks, um, and it's accelerating. That these issuers are adding the spot Bitcoin ETFs to other portfolio strategies like fixed income or defensive strategies or Nasdaq strategies or whatever. And actually, I can't remember now, Macroscope, I think, tweeted this out at the end of the day today that um, BlackRock just filed another uh, paper with the SEC saying they're going to add this to a few more of their, their you know, different strategy portfolios. It's going to be in more and more stuff. And I would argue that what you're getting when you have the ETF products, and we talked about this before, but it's worth mentioning again. 
what you're getting when you get the when you have the ETF products isn't just people buying the straight ETF product and losing that same person as far as like a Bitcoin self custody, like a good Bitcoin citizen. It's not necessarily the case. What you are getting for sure, though, is people who would otherwise not buy the ETF or self custody the Bitcoin, helping drive the price up. This is the thing that people didn't price in. So when people say the ETF wasn't priced in, yeah, there's a lot of demand on the spot ETF for sure. But what's really going to blow people's brains is when all these little two to five to 7% allocations and all these other portfolios where these people were never going to buy the spot ETF, never going to buy spot Bitcoin, now they're pushing the price up too. That's the thing that the ETFs are doing that we didn't have priced in before. We didn't think about that. And now that's become a reality. I, I think I have something with that. Like, do you, do you think that I'm way off base there? Like, because I'm with you that this is, like I said, suboptimal if people want to hold spot Bitcoin. But you have to admit that you've expanded the group of marginal buyers now, you know, a thousand fold, basically, with these ETF products and the way they're available. Well, let's go down this road. I, I agree with you there. Now, of those thousand times individuals that are now exposed and looking and actually buying this ETF, in terms of per, a, per, sorry, a percentage of those would actually turn into, and I'm going to define them, an actual Bitcoiner, somebody that understands the fundamentals, understands that you could put this in cold storage, takes advantage of the cold storage, the stuff that makes Bitcoin Bitcoin, not, not a fiat Bitcoin, but Bitcoin. What makes Bitcoin Bitcoin? How many of the percentage of those people you think are going to be converted into that? I would say it's going to be extremely low. Fraction of a percent. So I'm not talking 1%, a fraction of that 1% would be converted into Bitcoin. They're all there for number go up. A lot of it, I would imagine, is businesses too. That That's the, the real thing that's driving this. It's institutional money that has now, and it, it, they have access to buying Bitcoin and that money comes in, drives the price up because it's a lot of it. But of the people that learn about Bitcoin, understand Bitcoin and get out of it, out of the fiat system that got us to this point, it's going to be small, very, very small. And that's a disservice, I think. SB charm, chiming in here in our private Telegram chat does not think the ETFs are that bad for custody. You'll we'll have to, he can make his case uh, <laughs> next time we have him on. But I, you know, well, don't get me. Amy, yeah. any word that it's, it's a, you know, they own, and I'm, they don't really own your keys, but let's pretend they do. Sure. Name me a situation where somebody owns your keys that is advantageous to the it's individual. Not, it's never. No, it's never. It's never. Correct. And yeah, like, yeah. if it's never, that's it. We just established case closed. Next story. <laughs> right? That's it. <laughs> like, there's, there's nothing you can do to try to convince me or anybody else. There, maybe there could be tax advantages. But again, you're playing within the fiat system. The only thing that matters in the end is how many sats you have, not how many yeah. dollars you have. And when you're yeah. dealing with this fiat system, it's then you're dealing with dollars. I prefer to deal with sats. How many sats do I have? That's what really matters to me. Could I could I convince you, this is the one thing I thought about today. Could I convince you that it's a good idea to buy the ETF in your retirement, your RSP account, and then take the tax refund you get for putting in your RSP uh, in buying spot with it at the end of the year? Could I convince you that's a good idea? What is the refund you get on your RSP? Is it like is it like 15 or 20%? I forget what it is. It's like pretty RSP, high though. I have no clue. It used I, to be I, high. Now I, I don't really remember now. I kind of want to I have to look into this because if there's a chance to get like 30% back at the end of a year. But RSP is it's gonna be a, a salary when you take it. So people that don't understand. Yeah, we take it at the end of your career, right? It's whatever, it's fine. Yeah. You know what? I don't know. I'm I, that's something I never even thought about because I'm not quite there yet. Maybe, maybe not. Do you know, do you want to hear a story? I'm going to put up my uh, former financial advisor on blast here. About 10 or 12 years ago, it was around the time I met my wife, honestly. I don't know when that was, 12 years ago. I was 25. I'll be 37 this year. So uh, when I met her, I had a retirement account that I had just started with uh, this company called Aligned Capital Partners. And it used to be family run office. Now it seems that it's been bought by some other people and I don't recognize any of the names on these emails. Two weeks ago, um, I sent them an email because they have like, I don't know, probably $15,000 of mine sitting in an old RSP that I haven't really thought about or done anything with in a long time. I thought, you know what I should do with that? I should buy one of the ETFs with it. I should just pump, pump it all into a Bitcoin ETF. I sent them an email two weeks ago and the, the EA, the executive assistant sent me an email back and said that I had to schedule a meeting. And I said, there's no meeting necessary. Here's the ticker symbol, put it in there. Let me know when it's done. Today, I got an email from a guy named, I'm going to name and shame here, actually. No. Yeah. No, no, think about yeah, it before you do, just in case. Yeah, mm, fine. I won't name him. <laughs> <and shame, but. laughs> 
But the guy, sent me, the guy <laughs> sent me an email, okay? And he makes the case to me in this email that he will not take stri- not take trading instructions via email. Fine, I kind of get that. There's probably some uh, rationale there. And he's like, you know, also, this is way outside your risk profile. We have to update your profile before we can do anything like this. The, 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 the amount is too great and the concentration is too great uh, for your current needs. And I wrote the guy back. I said, I'll tell you what, okay? Give me the account number. I'm going to transfer it to Wellsimple. And he didn't reply. So now I've, what am I down? I, the email, the first email I sent was February 17th. So what am I down on IBIT since the 17th? 40%, 30%, something like that. Something insane. The number's like enormous. And uh, so I'm going to give this guy a piece of my mind at some point. If he doesn't give me that um, account number tomorrow. This, this is the kind of thing that a lot of people are probably dealing with, unfortunately. And so this is another thing I think when people say the ETF is, is like priced in or whatever, I just think there's a lot of people who are going through the motions here, these meetings where people are trying to keep them in these two and 10 portfolio allocations. They don't want to do, uh, they don't want to hand over the keys, no pun intended, to have you manage the account yourself and you can just do IBIT or one of the other ETF offerings, you know, whichever your provider of choice is, you just put your money there and forget about it for 30 years. I think this is going to start coming too. And it may not start coming yet, but at the end of the year, when you're talking to your neighbor about how your investment account did, and he did 7% and you did 180% in Bitcoin. Like that's when it starts happening. Macro Alpha has a word for this, like the neighbor error or something like that. Like everybody's always comparing to their neighbor. I don't think it's an error. I actually think it's a good idea. And the more Bitcoiners that are out there holding spot in cold storage or holding ETF, the more people that will come into the space uh, one way or another as well. And so I like all this stuff. I don't know. I'm getting some... Um, I'm getting some good vibes, let's say, from uh, the different things I've seen and heard over the last little while. Here's a question for you. CPPIB is on the the story list today. Do you think CPPIB is going to be in uh, any of these Bitcoin products, either directly as an investment strategy or through any of these other offerings in the next two years? Because once that, once that happens, right, that's really governments in Bitcoin. And like, if it's not over now, I think it is over now, but if it's not over now, it's sure as shit over then, is it not? I think this we is have like po- possible pensions. or guaranteed. Well, there's already been pensions that are have already dedicated some of their allocation towards Bitcoin. They've purchased it for this. So why wouldn't the CPP, the Canada Pension Plan, do the same, which holds, I don't know what the number is, 500 and something, $590 billion, I think is the number last I saw under assets under management. That's a lot, right? So if they put a portion of that towards Bitcoin, which is very possible in the next little while, yeah, yeah certainly that, that's within the realm of possibility. Sure. Game changer? Again, whatever. Um, it, it's going to cause me to Incredibly buy... Incredibly uh, flat, emo- flat emotions over there in your basement compared to the emotions in my basement tonight. I, I had a stacking goal for 2024, and it's fucking... It's, it's starting to ruin it, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> it's making it more difficult <laughs> for me to get to, the, to that point. So, um, yeah, because the, re- the reality is, and I, I can't speak for everybody. And this is from my very narrow basement viewpoint. If the price of Bitcoin is $15,000, if it is $68,000, which, by the way, your block clock seems to be not working, Joey. It's stuck on 67. You should reset it or something. Um, the price is 67996 It's been stuck like that. for. It hasn't updated for, since yeah, we started. We must I'll, have I'll, call, I'll call D and come over. And no, just three. unplug it and plug it back in. That's all you got to do. It's on, <laughs> if there was a power outage, that would have stopped it from updating. So for my, you know, the price of Bitcoin, if it's 15, 68 or 268, it doesn't change a thing for me. I'm not going to change my lifestyle. I'm not going to do a thing to change my anything, but I'm just going to keep stacking. That's the reality of it. So I just, I was hoping I could buy it on the sheet. This is obviously outside my control, but now I'm going to have to buy it a little bit more expensive. And it looks like I'm going to buy even more expensive moving forward, unfortunately, but it's not going to change anything. I don't give a fuck. I'm still going to drive my 22 year old, 22 year old car. I'm going to keep driving that until it's no longer <laughs> able to drive. I'll be happy doing it. And then I'll get that beige Corolla I always wanted. And I'll drive that thing to the ground too. Nothing changes. That's why for me, I don't care what the fuck the price is. It's just, it's another day. Yeah. I'm with you there. I'm, I'm not planning to sell or trade my Bitcoin. I'm never going back to fiat with that stack. I tried to have this conversation with somebody the other day. They messaged me, uh, I think after last week's show, um, text message a friend of mine and he's like, what, you know, what's your plan to sell? And I'm like, listen, man, you don't get it. Like, I'm not, I'm not going back to fiat. Like if, if the price goes to a hundred K you gotta, you have to put in perspective, in perspective for people, especially onlookers. 
what has to happen in the traditional world for the price of Bitcoin to go to $100,000 US? Like th that's a lot of people speculating on a currency product that could uproot the entire global financial system in terms of like where they store their value, what they perceive to be a store of value. You don't go backwards from there. You know, if you look at any currency chart, we're seeing these posts steady today. Uh, it's knocking off one currency after another. It's on, it's on par now, market cap with silver lend. Um, it's yeah. If you ever take, it's either slightly, like it's slightly that's, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't whatever. Go, yeah, but you don't go back is what I'm saying. You don't go back to the currency that you traded for that, that asset when that asset is performing that well, because everyone will eventually want to take that asset. It's hard to explain to people. And, and there's not many, like I said, not many people I spend time trying to maybe not convince, but explain my rationale and my thinking when it comes to like the Bitcoin investment strategy. But, uh, there's a lot of work to be done on that front. Actually, I'm going to ask Tour that next week. Um, you know, what do you say to people who ask like what the sell strategy is? How do you explain to them that the currency, you know, just isn't the thing that they should be looking at? It's and we've talked about this before. Everyone kind of knows intrinsically the currency is not the place to park their value. No one holds cash outside of an emergency fund or something, right? Or you know, if you're one of these people that does like six months salary in cash, no one does it. And uh, the reason they don't do it is because. Now more than ever, everyone is keen to this whole inflation. Everything is going up in price except the currency that's going down in value, blah, blah, blah. Everyone kind of gets it. And they don't seem to get it with Bitcoin. But they're they're going to at some point because they're going to have no choice. It's just I would like for a lot of my friends and loved ones to get it before then. And you know, so far I'm having, uh, I don't know, middling success. I am. We are doing great with people in the chat, though. <laughs> Listeners and viewers, we're, you know, we they're really... We made orange it. Pill. We made it for them. Yeah. Yeah. They're orange pill. Now, if, <laughs> yeah. For me, and then again, I'll use my own narrow viewpoint of things. I never trading it. Sorry. I hope to never <clears> trade it <throat> for cash. But there may be a time when I need cash for something to payable. Or like then I could understand then trading it for cash. Sure. Ideally, yeah, I would love to trade it for either a good or service in the future. But one thing that's being uh, is prohibiting me from doing it on a large scale is the capital tax. Yeah, that I have to uh, declare with our tax people here, CRA. I don't know where it's like in other parts of the world, but here we pay capital got capital gains uh, tax on, on selling your Bitcoin if it's a gain or a loss. Then you know you, you could claim that as a loss. We could talk about that in a bit too. Yeah, yeah, but that's the one thing that's precluding me from moving forward with selling a lot of it for goods or services. I don't want to deal with the headache of dealing with CRA. But anyway, CRA. Let's move on. Um, some dude was uh, talking about. On, tw on Reddit, and he was making a lot of trades in the past few years. And it's not simply with Bitcoin, he did it with shitcoins as well. And in fact, he said he lost a few hundred thousand dollars through his trades. And I can understand that if you had to you know, put a lot into it, and especially these shitcoins that went close to zero, uh, I could see that he lost some of that, but or almost everything. But he, he submitted this to CRA at the end. It was actually for taxes in years past, for tax that you filed in, year past, in years past as a way to take advantage of reporting a loss. So he submitted this information that he got from Kraken because he used that exchange primarily and also Coinly. It's a product a lot of people use to track their tax buys and sales. transaction product, right? Yeah, okay. CRA was having none of it. They wanted wow. more detailed information. So the Coinly okay. and what Kraken provided was not sufficient for them. And so they weren't satisfied. So just for people out there, you have to be aware that especially when you're trading KYC Bitcoin or something else into something else like USDT, Liquid, anything that's not named Bitcoin, that is a taxable event. So you will need to provide a detailed summary to CRA when asked. And also, this you know it's an administrative uh, headache, as I mentioned. People need to be aware that this is a requirement for you. Just in mm -hmm. case the tax man comes after you, they have every right to come after you if you do this, especially with KYC. Bitcoin. So check it out. If this might apply to other jurisdictions, but at least in Canada, this is one of the things we have to do. And I can say with a high degree of confidence that Canadians should be aware of this. That hold on to Bitcoin. If you don't, ignorance is not going to save you. Just curious, what did the CRA want? Was there a story update there? Like, I'm because that's really what everyone. The exchanges give you that data on your buys and sells, right? Like, I, I don't know what it looks like for. A place like you know Coinly, but I know ShakePay. You can get an X or CLV, whatever, whatever the Excel file format is, XLV, XLS, whatever, and it has all your trades on there. Your buy sells, your shaking sats has everything. So what if that's not enough? What else do they need? That's a good question. He didn't elaborate, 
Mm. But the fact that he, he mentioned that what Coinly provided and what Kraken provided was not enough, that to me is rather scary. Now, granted, he was probably asking for a lot, a few hundred thousand dollars worth of losses, and that's probably, you know, countless of trades. So the, yeah. the laundry list of trades that he's done, but still it shows you that they're not messing around. So when you're dealing with, with CRA and may, say may apply with the IRS, I have no clue, but you gotta be, you have to have all your ducks in orders in order, because if you don't, they could come after you. And that's something you don't want to go through. You, you don't want to bend over and have them look at you through your anus. They just you know. Those services like the CRA, you say what you want about them. You know, that's a function of the Canadian government. It's an important one. I think, you know, people say taxation is theft. Maybe, maybe not. I, I My concern for those services is not that they're going to be made irrelevant. There's always going to be an attempt at tax collection, but man, like they just were not prepared for stuff like free trading for retail and definitely not for stuff like free crypto trading for retail where everyone now is just high volume. You know what I mean? Like there was a time when doing a certain amount of trades in your TFSA made you a day trader. It would exempt you from the capital gains uh, protections that the TFSA allows you. <laughs> like these guys, they, they're not ready for this kind of stuff. And we don't talk about this a lot. We talk about, um, you know, this sort of in the same vein, these, these stories where governments and, and large institutions are trying to play catch up with the tech in terms of enforcement. Sometimes, you know, it, uh, the attempt is fruitless and doesn't look to have an easy solution for the powers that be. This is another one of those examples that's kind of under the radar. There's just not enough manpower to go through all these documents for all these high volume retail traders. Is there like, no. like, can you imagine going through like someone's Kraken or Binance history, trying to find well, out whether they have a capital loss or not? In the States, they hired what is it 89,000 irs agents so maybe they oh are equipped God. over no those States. are they're going after high what high net worth individuals remember that's what we were told oh. yeah maybe when they're done you're after call, that you're not you're the, not calling them liars are you i think they're, <laughs> no no but they're armed like so i'm not gonna call sound, them anything but sir sounds madam like maybe sounds like <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> let's talk about right. wef <laughs> and then I, we don't talk about the w because i'll be honest i don't really care about them I, but they, you're not a big WEF guy. Eh? We, you're right. We hardly ever hit WEF on this show. Can you nah, nah, WEF Miners podcast? I, I, I don't know. For some reason, it, it just it doesn't bother me. Whatever they do, but it's just interesting. This past week, though, something came out because it was with respect to Bitcoin, and it shows that they might be pro Bitcoin mining in certain situations. Because yeah. uh, they released a video. It was a several minute video about a chocolate factory in Congo, and the chocolate factory they say is powered by zero. Sorry, net zero Bitcoin mining. That's what they call they call it. And so a little bit more about it is they have a mining operation adjacent to this chocolate factory. And that mining operation is powered by a hydroelectric power station. And the excess electricity that is being generated is that's no not used by the Bitcoin mining operation is diverted to the chocolate factory. So in other words, it's more electricity that is being generated that could be consumed by the ASICs. Well, the chocolate factory gets the remainder. It's sort of a load balancer. We you know, we talk about this all the fucking time. That this is one case use for Bitcoin mining operations. It's been and years, by the way, we're talking about this. Liter literally years. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and the good thing about this one is the infrastructure is being built up by the proceeds by the Bitcoin mining company. So they're expanding their operations. They're buying, improving the quality of life of the people there. So it's all in all, it's a net gain. They say the miner is earning... 100 and it's not on my bingo card either. It's uh the miner is earning about 150,000 per month. I'm not sure if this is revenue or profit, they didn't say, but they do say that the amount that's being generated this 150,000 per month is more than a local tourism generates. So the, there's economic incentive to actually do this. So yeah, I just found it to be quite odd that the WEF would be promoting this as a as a good thing given their stance about uh pollution climate change and and a lot of people saying that bitcoin uses too much energy as a load balancer like ah, yeah you can't deny this as being a bad thing and they're saying it's a good thing like something's up man this is uh gonna continue i mean this is a good story obviously it's kind of cool that wf posted this video of a guy making chocolate and this bitcoin mining angle almost unbelievable like boomer says i just posted his message there in the chat uh should we talk a bit about, in the same vein, the move that some miners look to be making toward nuclear power for their facilities? Uh, 
this like this is going to become pretty significant because Amazon did it. Yeah, there. Well, Amazon was it was kind of pushed into it by uh, man, I forget the name of the miner now. I forget the name of the miner, but one of the miners. Um, helped Amazon nudge. pushed it. Was pushed. I wasn't was, aware. Was nudged. Yeah, into it. I guess it was the it was an initiative by some mining group. I forget now, but you can look at um, you know the tweets from the Usual Suspects, probably Perry and Boring and Dennis Porter, um, and find out. The, the power story when it comes to mining, load balancing, and moving toward, quote-unquote, greener energy products away from fossils and toward nuclear, not toward wind and solar, the kind of, you know, bullshit intermittents that don't work. We all know they don't work. But but toward nuclear and SMRs, uh, I think it's going to be a big story. We have uh, Ryan McLeod, nuclear Bitcoiner, coming on in the next few weeks uh, to talk about this. He's, um, you know, been keen, sending me a lot of content to look at and read. There's certainly a move happening in a lot of what I would call more serious countries about power, countries that need to build out their grids in a way that's, you know, both sustainable and reliable and fast. And uh, there's not that many ways around nuclear from that perspective. And so, you know, I know this is a little bit far from the WEF story, but I think it's important all the same because we, for the longest time, have been saying that, you know, only, only people who are both intellectually honest and serious about environmental protection go toward nuclear. If you're in, if you're serious about environmental protection, but not intellectually honest, you sit with stuff like solar and wind. And if you're neither, then, uh, you know, you just put up a stink about everything that's not um, intermittent and barely working. And so I, I expect to see more of this. Do you think in the next, I don't know, I'm in, I'm in like a calling my shots mood here. In the next like two years, are we going to get a Bitcoin mining outfit partnering with uh, like an SMR manufacturer in a small country where there's not so much red tape. I think El Salvador is a good candidate for this, honestly, but I'm not sure what their nuclear uh, capacity is. I know that you don't necessarily need to build near water. You can do salt cooling now, but I, I'd be curious what you think about that. Is that something you think you're going to see? A lot of hash rate coming online, having going to push people toward cheaper energy, more reliable energy. To me, it's a natural next step, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I think it's it's more longer term. I don't think it's it's in the short even to an immediate future. I, I think more it's going to be oil and gas is going to be using their energy, their wasted energy, and they're going to monetize that before we, we see yeah. SMRs. And it, with respect to, to El Salvador, I, I could be totally wrong on this, but aren't they putting a lot of capital towards their the, their thermal? Uh, I, okay, so I was going to say something about that. I don't want to really shit talk El Salvador, but that really hasn't materialized at all. I don't think, as far as I can tell, that seems to me like it'd be a big story. I haven't heard anything. Maybe I'm missing. Yeah. It could be a blind spot, but I, I mean, Jaime, I don't know was on, Jaime was on two months ago, three months ago. What did he say? Nothing he's, probably. He's nothing about it, but he's coming on later this month, I think. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, maybe I will I'll, maybe I'll sit in for that one. Maybe we'll do a joint, um, a sure. joint rip. So I do have some questions for him about, um, Bukele. I'm, I'm not, I, as, you know, I'm not as like I told him. On, yeah, naive as I said, everyone else. Is, I don't think. Anytime you <laughs> want to come on and talk about El Salvador or even stuff in your life, that you know, we'll roll with the red carpet. Stuff too, in your on. life, yeah. Come no, because you've been really good. Beer league soccer right? games. Like, yeah, if you want to talk, but he, obviously he's not going to. But like, I give him the option. You know, you know, he's a good guy and he's been good to us. And I want to, you know, make sure that he, yeah, he's, definitely, he knows definitely. that he's welcome on this show anytime he wants. Oh, of course, um, no doubt. Okay, so that's good. that's an interesting story though. I I do like that the WF is kind of sort of coming around it's possible that whoever put that video out you know has been fired since then some intern just getting <laughs> let go but it's also possible that someone in the higher ranks of the wf put that out so let's see if we see more of that then we're great if we don't <laughs> we'll see yeah if this is a come one-off on, <laughs> come, come on uh cvp tell us the story of your uh, unceremonious uh, exit <laughs> yeah. <from> the <laughs> we'll roll the carpet for you too buddy boy um <laughs> since we're talking about africa let's stay in the continent over there because strike they have entered the African continent. So I'm not sure if you saw this announcement. And Jack Mullers says that it's going to be Strike Africa is now live. That's what we call it, Strike Africa. I'm not sure if you saw the blog that uh, it started. Uh, that he wrote about it, but he started it off with "Yo" in the fucking blog. It said "Yo." That's the very I first know. thing. We're not a fan of that on this program. <laughs> I know you're not. For me, I'm like, <laughs> well, whatever. I, I just wanted to bring that up. It's pretty fucking funny, anyways. And these services are going to be uh, initially rolled out to. Ivory Coast, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, and a few other countries, and they're going to be expanding upon that as well. And so he's 
uh, saying that this is going to open the doors to onboarding people in those countries into Bitcoin using both on-chain and Lightning. Plus, they're going to be offering services, including USDT. I know that stable coins are very popular in some countries, and this is going to be another offering of stable coins that they could use. So it could be not only just onboarding, but also peer-to-peer. You could do that with Strike, and so that's one way to exchange your money. And this is the first full expansion by Strike outside of the United States. They haven't come to Canada. They're going to Africa first. Whatever. Um, I have nothing bad about to say about this. I think it's good. More opportunity, more options, and more people to, to, to start using Bitcoin, or at the very least, a stable coin where you know they they don't get access to actual U.S. dollars. And I know Nigeria; they're having some difficulties over there with trying to access Coinbase or sorry, Binance. I don't think they have Coinbase there, but Binance. I know the government is shutting off people's ability to get on there. This might be a way around that. I don't know, but giving people options cheap options to use and get into bitcoin i like it this is a good thing yeah same uh i don't really have much else to say about that i mean it's good to see those guys expanding i, I think Maller's, you know not to beat a dead horse here but he's under delivered i think on a lot of the promises he's made I, I don't think there's any doubt about that not for lack of trying maybe i'm not sure but um you know he did start up a podcast instead of continuing to work on some of the stuff he promised i think three years ago now at bitcoin miami maybe longer so um I wish them all the best. Interesting note there about Canada, right? Like Canada is this weird uh, country that's really done a poor job in terms of like bringing in opportunities for its citizens thanks to the banking cartel. Like we don't have strike here. It's funny, a little business on there. Len and I, when the podcast started, before we had the great sponsors we have now, you know, we were looking for ways to monetize. One of the ways to do it is through Anchor. And Anchor still to this day is like knocking our door down to try and put preloaded ads into the shows. And if the ads were decent for decent companies, like I would consider doing it, of course. But you know what the problem is? You can't get paid by Anchor if you're a Canadian because you need a Stripe account. And if you don't have a Stripe account, then you can't get any money. So you just kind of SOL. Like, I, I don't know what the, you know, what the solution for that is, but it's weird to see like countries in Africa getting opportunities vis-a-vis these new age banking apps, these like fintech applications that we just don't have here. I'm still sending e-transfers to people instead of using Venmo, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't seem to be, you know, in the cards that it's going to change anytime soon. Weird, really weird. Yeah, that's a very good point. It could be resistance from the, the banking system over here, which has deep roots and they don't want to give up whatever they have, whatever advantage they have gained so far. So that could be it. Um, but, but at the very least, we have other options here, like with uh, e-transfer for sending fiat. But you know what? You can still send it with lightning. Yeah, you know, it's, it's Bitcoin or bust, right? Like that's kind of where we are now. Yeah, Push, well, pushing pushing people to Bitcoin, right? Every every day, someone in the chat said earlier that the CRA's like tax uh, rules are forcing people to hodl Bitcoin and driving the price up too. It's a great point. You know, we don't talk about that enough. Yeah, see, I'm an example of that. I'm yeah. likely not to spend on a big purchase my Bitcoin because of all the requirements for me to report it, and I'd just rather hold on to it to either wait until the rules change or if I happen to pick up and leave and go somewhere else Mm -hmm. and then I can take advantage of of the opportunity that jurisdiction has to provide me. So um, we'll do one last story. I think we have time for that. Yeah, yeah, sure. 52 for sure. Yeah. So the Department of Energy, we talked about them. They They were asking Bitcoin miners to voluntarily disclose us bitcoin miners to disclose information related to their energy consumption looks like we got some closure on this story at least for now though <laughs> so why and a few other companies they decided to launch a lawsuit and they were saying at the time that was an unfair practice and the department of energy decided to temporarily halt the program we talked about this last week and so this week though they decided to or they announced that they're going to permanently shelve the program, at least the one that they have rolled out to this date. It's also being reported that the government must destroy all the data collected to date, also pay the legal fees, and start over legally with public notice and comment. Mm -hmm. So looking at this, reading between the lines, it's not to say they're not going to go ahead with something like this again. They may, but the process will be slightly different moving forward because, uh, you know, if you look at the Bitcoin miners, they're, they're not out of the woods yet with respect to being forced fallen told to disclose information <laughs> you know if you go look further fox 
Business is reporting this past week that the White House is voicing concerns about the sustainability of the power grid mm -hmm. as the price of Bitcoin continues to go up. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at this, there may be another request moving forward by the Department of Energy. Um, but this time around, they're going to have all their I's dotted and their T's crossed. So there, there won't be any lawsuits to sideswipe them. So one thing they could always say too, to go ahead with it, they could cite long-term implications of energy consumptions, environmental sustainability, all the shit like that, that works with normies out there. And well, in terms of people out there that are voting, normies outnumber Bitcoiners by a large percentage. So if you appease to those normies and you say, look, this is one reason why we should do it. And you say they're bad for the environment. They take up too much energy and shit like that. And normies scoop it up. Well, you're going to have this type of policy put in place. And uh, what are they going to do with this, this information once they gather it? We could uh, hypothesize what's going to happen. No, we don't, we don't have to hypothesize. We talked about it last week. Their intention is to take the information and make Bitcoin mining very difficult or outright illegal in the United States. That's in their stated goals from 2021. So we don't have to guess. We know. They've told us already. Uh, Liz Warren and, and the boys over there, they're they are up to no good. Brian Morgenstern, um, I, I still think I want to get him on the show to talk about this because he's obviously got the inside scoop working at Riot, uh, you know, heading up their efforts here. The thing that I would say, Len, in terms of energy, and we talked about this last week, but I'll rehash it since we have a rather large audience tonight. There's a, a world that's not too far from our reality it is easily inside the Overton window where as driving season approaches and the strain on grids really ramps up uh, and oil moves from $75 a barrel to 90 or 92 or $94 a barrel in the summertime and the SPR doesn't have the same amount of oil to give. The administration points at Bitcoin as the cause for energy prices going up and makes a huge attempt to stifle mining and squash the price all in one go. And they do it with the ETFs and they do it with the miners and they do it through that wedge and uh, say that the grids are unreliable because of Bitcoin mining. We have to get this under control. We're seizing this until we know what we can do about this. In the meantime, uh, everyone will get their cash back or something like that. And we're going to keep the rest uh, in custody. The miners on the on US shores will have to shut down for an indeterminate period of time. It's an emergency, blah, blah, blah. I realize this is like unsavory and uh, you know probably upsetting for some people. It's like crazy that we're in this world where this can happen. I think this is definitely possible. But to say that this is outside the realm of possibility is it's wrong at this point. Um, the, the people in charge in Washington are political killers more than anything, and uh, you know the control of the money is the most important piece of the puzzle for them at this point. It may be one of the few pieces of the puzzle they have left, and they're not going to let it slip away. They're going to take advantage of that uh, difficulty that people have. And I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, some variance between the reactions from certain states where Bitcoin mining is going on. You know, do I think Texas is going to shut down its Bitcoin miners? No, I don't. Do I think that other red states are going to shut down their Bitcoin miners? No, I don't. I think there's going to be a problem. And uh, that's going to add to this cocktail, this, uh, you know, this bomb that's brewing um, over in the United States as we head into an election cycle. Uh, you saw today the whining and crying about the Supreme Court dropping a 9-0 bomb on the uh, anti-Trump crowd, making sure he's on every ballot. It was 9-0? 9-0. Hardly ever see that, eh? And uh, so, fuck. yeah, not great for um, for all those people who have been like screaming into their pillow about this guy for the last eight years at this point. I can't imagine being that obsessed, but there are tons of people who just live in that world. Um, the, 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 the other problem that uh, Bitcoiners are going to have in the States is that you know, if the price on Bitcoin was 20000 and we hadn't spent the last, you know, six, eight weeks absolutely fucking dunking on everybody and their mother and brother, um, there's the people who are sort of normies and don't care about Bitcoin wouldn't maybe have much to say. But now that the price is $70,000, um, we are wearing a bit of a target, I think, more than we were two months ago or three months ago. And a lot of people are going to be gunning for our, for blood, right? You don't. You have no idea how many of your friends who have no Bitcoin are watching the price more closely than you and praying every night to the infant Jesus and Mother Mary for government action against your assets. There are tons of people, and a bunch of them are your friends. And uh, they're going to vote for something like this or support something like this from the Biden administration. I don't think this is out of their own possibility. I think it's something that we should all be concerned about. So I'm looking at that. 
I could see there's definitely a possibility that the government does some enforcement action. I'm not, you know, I kind of wish they do it in a way too. <laughs> like, I, like it, it seems like it's inevitable. Let's go through this whole process and let's prove that a decentralized system cannot be shut down. <laughs> and it, there may be some more pain, temporary pain, but long-term gain as there's, I, 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 you know, bring it on. I'd love to see that. Also, it also helped my 2024 stack and go. I'd reach it much, much sooner <laughs> because it's not <laughs> another reason. But yeah, so now I'm going to ask you the question really quick before we sign off on this segment of the show. Go. As I asked Dan and Mike this from the High Hash Rate podcast, who would you rather see retire first? Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren? Oh, I mean, Biden is already retired like he's you know no but he if knowing that he at least everything is showing that he no, wants liz to i'd rather see liz retire for sure yeah really yeah of course i mean how, how could you not she's clearly curried some favor with people in washington and is able to swing this stick i mean it's incredible to me that she's been able to achieve all these things and garner the support that she has under the banner of Something as blatantly insane as anti crypto army. What the fuck are you talking about? Don't you have like she's up army? against some stiff resistance, from what I understand. There's somebody running against her that is has I'm not um, gonna get stiff until 69k. And it, depending if you look at your block clock, you'll never get there. You're gonna be just limp for the rest of your life because you gotta All restart right. that <laughs> block clock. But uh apparently somebody's running against her that has Bitcoin and shitcoin connections. She'll she'll never lose, Len. Like she'll she'll never lose. She's entrenched. The American system is worse than ours. Man. I, I, like you just so many seats no, are, you know, hundred year Democrat. You know, you could run a paper bag. It would have to be paper. It can't be can't be plastic because it's bad for the environment. You could run a paper bag and and win under the Democrat districts. banner. banner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, who's going to run as the, the Democratic nominee for the Senate over there? I mean, I, I'm not sure if, if he's running for in that regard or running for the Republic. I have no idea. But it's, it's get getting some waves. Uh, yeah, let's get him on. So yeah. in terms of her, she's 75 last I checked. She, I, she's a little bit older than I thought. So really, how much time does she have left in terms of being elected? Like, do you think she's going to be How old's Pelosi? Time? How old's Pelosi? 88? That's what I'm going to get. Like, they're, are they the exception? Like the <laughs> Is Pelosi fight? that old? I can't believe I just said she's that. She's got to right be in, in, in the... She, there was a, wasn't there a picture of Pelosi with... Um, 83. She's 83. Yeah. Holy shit. It, it was a Feinstein or, or McConnell, Pelosi, 82, a... Biden, 81. That is nuts, man. Yeah. There's pictures of her, like, you know, somewhat like a former president tapping her on the head before there was, you know, FM radio or color TV. I mean, she's definitely got a, a wide ranging sort of understanding of politics. Thanks to the time she spent there. But, you know, Elizabeth Warren, she's only been there for since 2008. She hasn't been elected all that no, long. I mean, I mean Pelosi. I mean Pelosi. Pelosi, yeah. Okay. Warren, so, Warren's a whole other story. Warren ran for president in 2012. So, and I, after that, I think, didn't she? I, I think it, the Bernie, the year that Bernie had a lot of momentum was, that was the year Trump won. And I think she was on that. Um, She's in those primaries too. So that private jet video, I thought that it was eight years ago. I, I could have been wrong. That's a great video though. I love that one where she's hiding behind the... uh sort of portly intern there good for her <laughs> let's leave it at that joey let's end this bitcoin related stuff and move on to the notable stories joey if you get all right time. we're about to get notable over here put on your notable costume we'll see you back here in uh five seconds if <laughs> unless you're on audio if you're on audio we'll see you tomorrow but if you're on video just stay there just stay in the chat <laughs> are you a fan of the old school nhl 94 game on the genesis or snes why not check out my show, the NHL 94 Podcast, from tournaments and tactics to the people who make up this community. Check it out wherever you listen to podcasts or find it on YouTube.